five, four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Lift off. We have a lift off. Hello and welcome back to Tennis Unfiltered with me, James Gray of inews.co.uk and the iNewspaper. Uh, George Belshaw is away. Uh, I, I hope you're listening, George. I hope you're enjoying Thailand and haven't fallen off a scooter yet. Uh, I do still have Calvin Bett on, but I'm delighted to say that we've got Ben Lewis with us today, who is the co-host of Matchpoint Canada, the official podcast of Tennis Canada um, and an author for all sorts of other places and general expert on tennis. Ben, thank you so much for coming on. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure, guys. Thanks for having me. No, no, no. Uh, Calvin, y- y- you've had a really exciting rock and roll weekend, I hear. Yeah, I spent um, the majority of the weekend watching um, doubles tie breaks uh, to do some of my own research. Um, so, yeah. Basically, how, how many like, tie breaks do you think you watched? Uh, I know exactly how many I watched. 52. <laughs> um, that, well, that was... I, 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 slight light. I, for the reason I was watching them, I didn't watch fifty-two full. It was all champions tie breaks. I didn't okay. watch fifty-two full ones because I was looking for something specific in the score. And mm. if once that hadn't happened, then I'd stop watching it. Right. Okay. Very good. Well, that, that that just if you wonder if I wonder what tennis coaches get up to in the off season, it does sound incredibly fun. Um, but there you go. Uh, I look forward to seeing the results of it later on. Um, well, so we had kind of planned to get Ben on at some point uh, on the podcast, and uh, George being away has happened at a very good time, Ben, because Canada are currently, and it may only be for about two weeks, the holders of both team tennis major tournaments at the moment so it, it's timely that you have arrived um i know the Billie jean king cup is a little bit in the rear view mirror now but I, I wondered if you could kind of reflect on on that victory and and i wonder if you have any inkling of, of how and why now it, it kind of came about yeah i i mean to reflect obviously i i think the the story of the event the event rate was Layla Annie Fernandez. I, I mean, just this unbelievable resurgence in form. I thought the way she played was pretty reminiscent of that finals at the U.S. Open two years ago in the summer where she just took off. She toppled, you know, four top 10 players in a row on en route to the finals there. And of course, uh, for a lot of people, I, I mean, for those in Great Britain, of course, we remember that as Emma Raducanu's title, but there were so many unusual events leading up to that. And on the other side, fans in Canada here were following this remarkable rise of Layla and it was fitting that those two played in the finals and not that they've had parallel careers in really any particular sense except expectations were so high for both of those two following that US Open in in 2021 and of course Emma's dealt with all these injuries she struggled in 2022 and I, I think for many as well, Layla took a step back uh, as well, especially sort of the front end of the year. She was out of form. At one point, she almost dropped outside the top 100. She wasn't winning consecutive matches. And it, it finally has sort of come together over these past couple of months. And to see her just kind of take over on the international stage uh, was was great to see. We know how well she plays in, in front of a crowd and with an atmosphere. And then this was also sort of a an introduction to another Canadian, an 18-year-old Marina Stakusic, who was really a complete unknown for probably almost everybody watching. And sort of fascinating for me because just a couple of weeks prior to her going to the Billie Jean King Cup, I was watching her play this Tevlin Challenger in Toronto where, you know, you have other players who are outside the top 500, just kind of trying to get their careers going, trying to hang on to their careers, like Arena Rodionova was there. So it, wow. it was quite a juxtaposition of different players at different stages of their careers. And Stukusic was the star of the show there. And to see her break through on the international stage just a couple weeks later, pretty incredible. And I, I guess it's kind of tells you, you really never know when that breakthrough is going to come for a country. Uh, you, you don't, you know, it's, it's sort of who's hot at the right time. I find with Billie Jean King cup with Davis cup. And uh, I, I really didn't see this title coming, especially when they were lining up against the Czechs in the semifinals. Has it had much of an impact? You know, because I mean, I remember when GB won the Davis Cup in 2015. It felt like a pretty big um, event. Uh, obviously, we'd never won 
never won the Fed Cup, Calvin, maybe back in the 70s. I know we made the final at one point. Uh, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Mm. Anyway, but either way, the Billie Jean King Cup, I think, has struggled to kind of penetrate the consciousness. Do you think Canada winning it was a big deal back home? It it was, considering we are always sort of, you know, fighting to get the coverage that hockey will get here, sure. uh, which, you know, we're always going to take a backseat to, to that. Uh, we do need these big performances uh, for people to take notice. And I thought this was particularly big, especially I, I think a lot of people didn't really follow the Billie Jean King Cup before. Davis Cup was a little bit more followed. Last year when Canada won Davis Cup, they were competing with Canada's men's national soccer team who was in the World Cup for the first time in over 30 years. That was happening yeah. simultaneously. So that was a bit of a problem. Uh, I think it happened in a good week in the sense that the sporting world felt a little more quiet compared to when we won Davis Cup last year. Right. Um, and, and you neatly bring me on to Davis Cup because obviously that is we are now. It literally starts today. Um, I'm flying out on Wednesday to Malaga. Um, Canada open up tomorrow against Finland. Calvin, I guess that the first kind of big piece of news is that Andy Murray is out of the Davis Cup. We're expecting to see him potentially even play against Djokovic. That's what I was hoping for anyway. Um, I think I know what you're going to say to this because you've already said it to me privately. But how big a blow is it, Murray being out for, for Britain against Serbia? I actually don't think it makes a particular difference because I don't think he would have played the singles. I, I can't see them putting um, Murray into play Djokovic ahead of Norrie. Mm. Um, and I know there's some conjecture. I know a lot. Of, I know a few people are well connected, and, and it's it's pretty split as to whether Murray would have played the doubles. Um, right. I know Laura Robson said on TV the other day. I don't know whether she let it slip that she said that Leon was planning on playing Andy in the doubles. But I, I I have it on authority that that wasn't the case, that it was always going to be Joe and Neil who played doubles. Right. Um, so I'm not sure. On that basis, I don't actually think it's made any difference. You could even add that it hasn't made a world of difference in the, for the first leg for Dan Evans or Murray B now, because yeah. I think, you know, you've got to, this is obviously, as I say, if, if, I was a, if I was a friend of mine, but, you know, you, you wouldn't have him favourite against Djokovic, not the way that he's played in the last couple of days. Yeah. Um, and then I I think that Joe and Neil is as good a doubles player, as good a doubles, two good a doubles players as you're going to get around. What what they do as a pair is is going to be interesting. And, and depending on whether Djokovic plays in doubles, which I imagine he will if the doubles is live. Um, yeah. So for that tie in particular, you could argue I don't actually think it makes much difference because it's going to come down to basically whether Draper's going to beat their number two and then who wins the doubles. Yeah, um, I do think it, I mean, the blow will come if they get through that because then I think the tie, the, the tournament really opens up. I looked at the draw today and it's tough to really pick a favourite, I think, then. Um, from that point onwards in terms of if, if Serbia get knocked out. I think Serbia are only the favourites because they've got Djokovic. He's basically you're starting every match 1-0 up. Yeah. Um, and, and anybody who can do that, I think, is is going to be favourite. But I wouldn't make them huge favourite in terms of strength in depth. But, um, yeah, so we'll see. I think it'd be an interesting one because I do think that Draper will probably beat whoever... Serbia's number two is well. It'd be, I mean, on ranking, it's Laszlo Jere, but whether they go with him or Dusan Lajovic or even Kekmanovic, who's got a very good indoors record, that, that's the choice they have. I'd, I'd make I'd make Drake's favorite, not massive favorite, but I'd make him favorite against any of those. I think fully fit on an mm. indoor court. Mm. Hey, funnily enough, I, I'd written down Calvin. Who do we think our favorite is? I mean, Ben Canada are defending champions. They, they. I mean, I have to admit, I was looking through the the group stages, and obviously Canada went three and zero. I I don't know that I've ever seen or heard the name Alexis Galar now, and I apologise if I've mispronounced that before. Um, and then he goes two and zero in singles. You know, he obviously won his tie against Italy against Lorenzo Sinego. I, mean, I don't know. Maybe we won't see him against Finland. But where's he come from? Tell us a bit more about him. Yeah, Alexi Galar, no. Uh, I mean, he and Gabriel Diallo, they're very similar ages. And for me, have had kind of a similar trajectory career-wise because they both took the college route. And for Alexi, he, he played at, at North Carolina State and started his career a little bit later. And he had some challenger success. And um, Canadian fans had a chance to watch him in Toronto this summer. And honestly, he put on a heck of a show 
on the stadium court. He was up uh, a break in the third set against Francisco Sarandolo. He was up three love in the third set. And it, it looked like this sort of breakthrough moment um, that he was going to you know, beat a top 30 player here let that slip away but he seemed to derive a lot of confidence from that because just a few weeks later as you said uh beating lorenzo sinego playing this huge role for canada in a tie i like his backhand he's pretty athletic he's a smaller guy you know he's five foot ten in contrast mm-hmm. gabriel diallo is huge he's six yeah. foot eight with that big bomb of a serve so they're they're different style players but uh you know he's an athletic baseliner not like serious weapons from the back of the court but pretty solid all around he can counterpunch. He can be a little bit more aggressive. And I, I don't think he's going to be Canada's number two in this case. I think they're likely to lean Gabriel Diallo for the second single spot. Of course, Felix being number one in singles. But it's nice that they have another option there in case an injury creeps up. And of course, I mean, Milos Raonic is back on this roster as well for the first time in five years. And that's that's a big unknown <laughs> because, I mean, he's it's always an unknown with Milos. And that's always kind of related to health. Like we've seen, you know, when he is healthy, uh, he he can play top ten tennis. I mean, he beat Francis Tiafo in Toronto a few mm. you know a few months ago, which is crazy to think about. Then it's just how long does the body hold up for? That's always been the question with Milos. James, you you tell me all the time that Milos Ranch is retired. I'm sure you've declared. Well, I'm, I can only like tell you what times. he told me. Like I can only <laughs> tell you what he keeps telling me, which is ben, can like, you, uh, can you shed any light on that? Is he planning on playing well, next year or? I mean, Milos won't tell us, like, he, he won't really shed any light into his future at all. If you ask him, like, where are you going to be in a year's time? Where are you going to be in two years' time? He always says, I can't tell you because I don't know myself. He wants to be able to play in Australia and is, is preparing to play for 2024. But, I mean, the number of things that have gone wrong with his body in the, uh, in the past, whether it's the lower half with the leg, the hip, the calf, the shoulder, like, it, it's, it's been ongoing throughout his career. That's really been the story of his career. Um, I, I do think he intends to play 2024, and if he can get to the slams, I mean, I think it's safe to say we're never going to see Milos Raonic on a clay court again. Uh, why bother? <laughs> why bother? <laughs> but um, I, I think he has a little bit more tennis in, in the tank and and James it's fair to think like he he would retire because if you asked him a year ago I think that was weighing on his mind that he might very well hang it up and and stop and he he decided to give one more one final push and it's it's worked out in some sense because he got back to Wimbledon he won a few matches yeah I mean I, I interviewed him at Queens and actually he was very gracious because he had just pulled out of Queens with an injury. And he, I assumed that would be no game on the interview. And he still did the interview, which is a classy move to start with. And I said, oh, you know, what is this? What is, is, is it a comeback? Is it a swan song? He said, I wanted to compete. I want to play Wimbledon, Toronto and US Open. And then he didn't say, and nothing more. But he didn't say, you know, this is the beginning of something. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it, it is interesting. I think my impression, and you'll know him much better, Ben, but my impression was, he really misses competing and he thinks he didn't get all the chances in his career that he could have done because of his body. And that had he had two more Grand Slam finals, he probably would have won one. And had he had two more years of full fitness, he might well have got two more Grand Slam finals. I think that moment's probably passed now. Like, I think the get if he'd been around maybe two, three years ago, fully fit, I feel like there was an opportunity there. But... I struggle to see. I think there's more strength and depth now. I don't know. Maybe you see it differently. No, no, I, I, I'm with you. And uh, it's understandable that he said he wants to play, you know, Wimbledon, US Open, National Bank Open, uh, because he told us like that was what was on his calendar. And then after that, it's we'll see. We'll see how I'm feeling sort of post those events. And I mean, he's well enough to come and compete again for Canada with Dave, for Davis Cup. Do I think he's going to get in a match? I would honestly bet towards no. I, I will be surprised unless he's playing maybe a dead rubber in doubles and they put him on the court. But I I think we are going to see him in 2024. I don't think we're ever going to get the same full version of Milos because even now when he plays, like he admitted when he played Wimbledon, he kind of just, just held it together physically and 
you know, it's, it's pretty astonishing though, what he can do just with that one shot, because holding it together physically and he goes four sets with Tommy Paul at Wimbledon. It's, I think that tells you, like, I've always said for me, you know, probably he or John Isner, I think has the best tennis serve of all time. Uh, I mean, it's staggering what that weapon, how far that weapon has taken him. And I don't think he's ever been satisfied with what he's done in his career. Even if he's been to a Wimbledon final, been world number three, he says he has regrets. I know he lost that epic with Andy Murray, actually, at the uh, World Tour finals. What an opportunity there. That was Mm -hmm. one of the best matches he's played and he's lost. And so he he feels like he's left a couple things on the table. I I have a little story about Milo Franc. I might have told it on the podcast before. Um, I don't know, but I remember... I think it was probably 2017, I'm going to say. Um, and a player I coach, as, as happens around Wimbledon, and I was actually at Glastonbury at the time. Um, and um, somebody phoned me, um, an, an agent phoned me and asked if the player I coached at the time would be available to play with Milos Raonic um, the next day because he had a, um, he wanted to hit, but he also had a video shoot for New Balance um, that they were doing. Um, and at the time, this was like, this was on a Saturday at Glastonbury at about 5 p.m. So I was somewhat <laughs> inebriated. Um, and um, I said, yeah, I committed without asking the player, but, you know, it was going to happen. So then I drove back the next day um, to be there. So we played at Roehampton Club and basically the hit only lasted. He was a lovely guy, re- really nice guy, um, really quiet, as you'd imagine. But the hit only lasted 10 minutes because New Balance had this gimmick that they wanted to do, whereby, obviously, being Canadian, like and, and like uh, Ben hinted to, that ice hockey is the major sport over there, that they basically wanted this thing where Milos would serve at a guy in full ice hockey goalie outfit who was stood at the net. And so you had this bizarre scene at Roehampton Club, which is one of the poshest clubs in in the world, you'd say, on a grass court where there's this guy in a full ice hockey goalkeeper outfit stood at the net and Milos Raonic just firing 150 (laughs) mile an hour bombs at him and hitting him square in the chest, in the face. (laughs) And I've never seen the actual outcome of the video. I don't know whether they ever did anything with it, but it was one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen on a tennis court. Thank God your player was there to hit with him, Calvin. Otherwise, otherwise you're true. That that hit must have lasted about seven minutes total. (laughs) (laughs) Um, On a more serious note, Ben, Canada have got Finland in the first round. And I, I... I've been saying for a while that, like, I've talked about Otto Werten and, and Emil Savori before, and Calvin, we were talking about Harry Heliovara earlier today and his talents as a doubles player. I think this is a really tough draw for the defending champions first up. I, I think you're right. Uh, Finland, I, I think they're a little kind of flying under the radar, to be honest, he- heading in. As you said, Emil Ruzavori is, is super dangerous uh, in particular. And then, I, I mean, my big question, I, I think whoever's going to take that that lead singles match like Felix really has to sort of secure a point there for Canada I think that that match is going to be really crucial because then you're asking the question what version of Felix are we going to get are we going to get the Oji Aliasim who you know struggled absolutely mightily through the entire midpoint of the season through the summer swing as well. I mean, at one point he, he dropped 12 of 15 matches mm. or are we going to see the indoor Felix that we saw in Switzerland in Basel, where finally uh, we, we saw that form that we saw from him in 2022 when he kind of took over in the indoor season. I will say like, I do think Felix plays his very best indoors just on a quicker surface. I, I think that's beneficial to him. And he seems to have his, not only his confidence back, but, His serve, which was not really the weapon that it was last year through the midpoint of the season, it just wasn't there. I felt like he found it again in Basel. So if he's carrying over that form uh, to Davis Cup this week, I like his chances in that lead singles match. And then, you know, Diallo versus Vertanen to me is a bit of a coin flip. And then you're looking at doubles. Vashik Pospisil is going to play a really important role for Canada there. Hmm. Yeah, I, I have to say, Diallo against Verton, and there's not going to be many long points in that match. No. <laughs> there's going to be two <laughs> blokes hitting the ball extremely hard um, in that match. Ben, is um, the last time I saw... Um, name escapes me there. The guy who just said play doubles. Oh, Hospital. Hospital. Hmm. Hospital. Mm-hmm. 
Last time I saw Pospisil, I watched him play. What Luke, who I coach, his doubles partner played him in singles about four or five weeks ago, um, and it was pretty bad. Um, he was pretty poor in it, and he he wasn't serving with any kind of pace. And I was talking to a couple of people after, and they said his shoulder is just done. He can't serve at all anymore with any sort of pace. Is that correct? Or I mean, I I have my concerns, especially in. Toronto, I watched him play doubles and I think he was partnered with Mahu and his entire service arm was taped up from the shoulder all the way down to his forearm. Yeah. Like it was, it was concerning uh, to the point where I was honestly a little surprised he was bothering to play at that point. Like he'd already lost his singles match. Uh, so you wonder why, why is he bothering here uh, to play in doubles? Uh, so that has definitely been giving him some trouble and you look since Toronto and since I believe he did play US Open qualifying, he's played an incredibly abbrevi abbreviated schedule, maybe one challenger or two. Like he, he hasn't particularly played much. I don't know if he's been saving it for, for this event in Davis Cup. I, I mean, he's played more ties. He's probably played more ties than anybody anybody at the event here, actually. Uh, he's played the second most matches ever for Canada in this event, only behind Daniel Nestor. Uh, mm. Like, he seems to be probably the most experienced Davis Cup player of anybody out of the eight nations. I, I think he's gone through a training block. So you're right. It depends on the health of the soldier, the shoulder. Like, is that serve is going to be the weapon that it was last year in November where, you know, he and Felix were taking off like Tim Poots and the powerful German team and getting these big time doubles wins. Like it's fair to have uh, some trepidation about what Vasher can do on the court at the moment. Cause he really hasn't played much this year. Yeah. That did that German doubles team not go through a period where they won like something ridiculous, like 11 matches in a row. I don't know if they still pick the same pair, but when it they was did, Poots I think. and Kravitz, I think. Yep. They yep. just had this ridiculous run, and they were incredibly hard to beat in Davis Cup. So there's like there's three of them that they can rub to. It's Kravitz, Puetz, and Mays. And yeah, I yeah. I think they've basically they've all played with each other at some stage. Um, so, but I think Kravitz and Puetz are the they play. To, they're actually a pair that play together. Although yeah. Kravitz has won his um, two slams with Mays. All so. right, <laughs> bizarre. I mean, it's sort of the opposite of the British thing, right? Like we've got all these top. Play, doubles players that can't play with each other. <laughs> Jeremy, you've got these guys who can play with literally anyone. But I don't um, want to play with each other. <laughs> yeah, well, quite. Uh, if I have to put you on the spot then for each, I mean, uh, I appreciate that listeners, you, you may already know the result of the Canada-Finland uh, tie, in which case we're going to sound like idiots. Um, ben, are you, are you backing Canada's come through it despite it being a tricky opening match? I I do I do still back Canada, I think, in the quarterfinals. Um and that's really, I guess, backing Felix. And mm. I, I'm going to back Felix for the fact that it's indoor hard. Uh, the The fact that he sort of made that announcement after winning Basel saying, I'm back, told me he, he has his confidence back again, uh, that he feels like himself again on the court. So, uh, And I think he does get such a lift uh, from playing for, for Team Canada and having everybody on the sideline. So I, I do think Canada escapes kind of a tricky quarterfinal there. Um, I have questions over what happens in the semis if Canada is there, that's for sure. Yeah, probably against Australia or the Czech Republic, indeed. Um, and Calvin, Britain against Serbia, which way do you see it going? I, I think it's going to be really tight and tough to call. Um, I would, I do think it's 50-50. I I'm not don't normally like sitting on the fence here, but I think it's so difficult to call based on... I do think it'll be one all after the singles, mm -hmm. and then it comes down to the doubles. And then I, it's tough to say like what Djokovic is going to get in the doubles. Um, I'm going to say I'd probably slightly still favour Britain because I think that... Um, I think with Joe having just won World Tour Finals, um, he's going to be full of confidence. And then it will just depend what... I don't think Djokovic, you know, he obviously knows how to play, but he, not like he's had a, a, a fantastic doubles career. I mean, he usually wins a match and pulls out, so it's hard mm. to tell where he's at with his doubles. But the, whoever plays doubles with him, I don't think he'll be that great at doubles. It's going to be probably Kekmanovic, you'd imagine. Um mm. Well, because he did go through, he played with Chacic uh, at a couple of tournaments, I think, in an effort to to build a Davis Cup partnership. And I don't know why Chacic isn't in the squad. Maybe he's injured. Maybe I, I, I know why Chacic's not in the squad, because he's not very good. 
Um, <laughs> that's the main reason. Having, I see. Having watched him, he's. I went go on record to say I think he's the worst player in the top 100. <laughs> right. Okay. That seems like a reasonable non-pick then. Um, right. <laughs> Let's move swiftly on before we piss off any more Serbians um, and try and bring them back by talking about Novak Djokovic, uh, who won a record seventh ATP World Tour Finals title yesterday, beating Yannick Sinner in the final. He's now into 400 weeks as world number one. He's gone 55 and six this year. He says it's one of the best seasons I've had in my life, no doubt. To crown it with a win against a hometown hero in Yannick, who has played amazing tennis this week, is phenomenal. I'm very proud of the performances these past two days against Alcaraz and Sinner, probably the best two players in the world next to me and Medvedev at the moment. And the way they've been playing, I had to step it up. I think I played different tactically than I did in the group stage against Yannick. And just overall, it was a phenomenal week. Um, ben, no one beats Novak Djokovic twice in a week, do they? No, and... I think further to that, no one beats Novak Djokovic in his peak form indoors. I mean, we, you talk about his domination really across all surfaces. I, I mean, this is the most storied career in men's tennis of all time, without a doubt. It's, it's not really up for debate anymore, but it, it seems like when he's particularly dialed in on these fast indoor surfaces, uh, there's just no time or space to do anything. And we saw that with uh Carlos Alcaraz in the semifinals. It, it felt like Alcaraz was consistently pressed for time and space to, to be able to sort of dictate and never could. And Yannick Sinner, I mean, how fast out of the blocks was Novak in that match? It was just extraordinary. I think he dropped, what, two service points maybe in the opening set. I mean, he's just breezing through these service games, you know, spot serving the slider at wide up the tee. Yannick's getting no read on it. And then he, he's just suffocating him in these return games with his, his depth. Uh, it was just incredible to watch. And then you sort of look back at the group stage and you think, were we getting like... 50 60 percent level Novak and guys are have to, having to play out of their mind just to go three sets with them like Yannick has to play one of the matches of his life to win seven five or seven six pardon me in the third in the group stage against Novak who hasn't you know tapped into his top level I think that's that's the frightening thing for the rest of the tour is when you see him sort of hit this peak he he looks untouchable mm. yeah I I thought it was, you're right to point out the serving, Ben. Calvin, I mean, I, I know we've talked a lot about the Djokovic serve and over the years it's it's definitely got better, but I couldn't believe the way he was serving yesterday. Not like serving massive and hitting spots. So, like, you can't play against that realistically. Um, yeah, I, I all, I'm always a bit sceptical on this stuff with his serve. And this is not me saying that his serve isn't very good. It's very, very good. I get a bit frustrated when I hear people saying, I, mean, I know one of the commentators yesterday said he's got the best serve in the world. I, I don't think that's the case. He's just, he's got a good serve and he's the best player in the world behind it. But I think statistically, we, I think Tennis Insights did something last week of, of all of the players serves. And I think he was fifth on it in terms of actual quality of serve throughout the year. Mm. Um, I, I think it's, you know, the, he's just got, a, he's got a very good serve. I don't think he's got one of the best serves in the world. He served particularly well yesterday. Um, and Sinner actually isn't a great returner um, statistically throughout the year. So I think that kind of fits in very well. And he's just he's just very, very good. I mean, like yesterday, again, Tennis Insights, I don't know whether people saw that, but in the last two, his, two, his last two matches, semi and his final were in, they rate the performance of players in terms of serve quality, um, I think it's the five metrics that they use a serve quality, return quality, time in attack, uh, conversion rate and steal rate. Um, and Djokovic's numbers were, I think the tour average is 7.69 or something. And Djokovic in the last two matches averaged 9.7, um, hmm. which were basically the two highest, uh, two of the five highest ranked performances of the whole year. Um, he, he was excellent. Um, but again, I mean, I'll get a lot of crocodiles onto me here. It's they're matches that you would expect him to win as well. He was particularly good in them, but I think Alcaraz on a fast indoor court and Sinner, who Sinner played excellently against him earlier on in the week, but Sinner's not as good a tennis player as Novak Djokovic. <laughs> I, I guess that's the thing, isn't it? Like you put that much data into the Djokovic computer. I, I, I think 
I don't know. I, I just think it's a it's a proper nightmare having to play him. And actually, uh, in in our Q and A, we'll talk about maybe you know how much data you want to put into the Djokovic. Is, is that oversimplistic, Calvin? I don't know. I don't think it's the data, but I do think now, like he's in a position, he's playing excellently at the minute. Um, but I do think, and I've said this before, it, it's a, it's not a great era for the men's tennis at the minute. Like if you asked him now, would he rather? If you look at some of those World Tour finals, say eight, nine, ten years ago, when he's got he's got Federer in there, he's got Nadal in there, he's got um, he's got Murray in there, he's got Del Potro in there, Vavrinka in there. Like he's looking at them and thinking he's 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 the you know he's he's probably the best player of all time. So he's thinking I back myself to beat any of these guys. But he's more concerned than when he looks at this week and he sees who's he going to play in the final. I mean, he won't particularly enjoy playing Alcaraz, but then on a fast indoor, there's he's going to beat him. I don't think he's worried about playing Sinner or Sitsipas or Zverev in a final like that. So <clears throat> I think the era and and this tournament in particular, although I do think it was an excellent tournament to watch. The actual standard comparative to Djokovic wasn't what it's been in the past. Hmm. Well, and and I just just to add to that, I mean, even leading into the semifinals, you did guess get the best crop of four players through the season uh, by far. I, I mean, there's there's been a separation the entire year between we have Djokovic there, Alcaraz behind him, and then Medvedev and Sinner. I mean, those four have been without a doubt the best players of the year. The only four really to me that have shown sort of consistency on the ATP calendar, consistently making deep runs, consistently uh, picking up titles where we really haven't been able to trust any of the other guys in the top 10. So then you're thinking, well, if Djokovic is going to lose this title, this would be sort of the scenario. These are maybe the three other guys who could stop him. So I I think taking that into the equation and then seeing him win you know, the last four sets of the event, 6-3, I think, in all of them, right? 6-3, 6-3. Mm-hmm. So uh, I will say, like, Yannick Sinner didn't play a very good final. No? Like, he was... I, I know he said he was maybe physically feeling it a little bit, but there are sort of these key moments in matches where you need to land a shot. You need to get a quality return. He missed opportunities, for sure. And I think he had that... Uh, it was 3-2, 15-40 on Djokovic's serve there in the second set. I think at one point, Novak, you know, sort of rolled in a body serve and Sinner missed the return long. And these are kind of crucial moments of matches where you have to step up your level and and Sinner wasn't able to do it. He also had, I think it was 4-3 Djokovic. He had love 30, missed the second serve return. Mm-hmm. And then I think on the 30-all point, he, he missed a put-away forehand. He netted mm-hmm. it. Um and and he hit in total from love thirty on Djokovic's serve to go four all or four three I can't remember to go back on serve he hit four and four errors in a row um, that he had a good hit on every one of them um, and yeah I, I think he'd been excellent all week that was by far his worst his worst match I think it's mental when you think about it that there was a moment on the like if 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 Rune had won the third set um, it Djokovic would have been out of the tournament. Yeah. Um, so, and and this is what we have to talk about because everyone's been talking about it. Should Sinner have tanked? Should even could Sinner have tanked that match? I I would have tanked it. <laughs> you got to give yourself the look. Do you, who are you well, playing the final? Are, are you going to tank it to an obvious degree where the spectators no. are watching and thinking, "Hey, why isn't this guy? <laughs> why isn't this guy trying? Why why is why is he just struck his 25th double fault of the match?" Like how, how do you uh, my concern is how do you not only how do you tank a, a tennis match, but just how these players are wired as competitors that you're taking the court with the mindset of wanting to win each and every day. How do you sort of you know, take a step back from that and put that aside for one tennis match. I think that's kind of hard for these guys to do, is my feeling. It, it is. It's 100% difficult. I think it's unique because of the situation in that it's a round robin, that you're not actually losing anything yourself. Um, so it's not like you're throwing anything away in that regard. And I don't know if it, it's even possible, like I said. I didn't expect Sinner to tank, but there has to be a part of you that's looking at and thinking, what's the goal of this week? The goal of this week is to win the tournament. What <laughs> outcome gives me the best chance of winning this tournament and I think that that has to come into it and especially once he's like three all I mean four all in the third with Runa like he could just have you know 
well, could just have played four a game unforced like, errors. Four yeah. unforced errors. Like, like, well, know. I remember. Didn't I, I recall this conversation? I think happening last year when you know Djokovic also won won the World Tour Finals, and he was playing um, a, a singles match to close the group stage against Medvedev, and Djokovic had already advanced. He'd already secured his place in the semifinals. I think Medvedev was already eliminated, so the question is, what are they playing for? And these two went toe-to-toe for three sets, like three hours, something mm. like seven, six in the third. Djokovic at one point was, you know, shaking on the sidelines, gasping for air, and people were weighing in on, on social, being like, well, what is this guy doing? Like, he's already in the semifinals. Why is he physically destroying himself to try and beat Daniel Medvedev? here and I, I think afterwards he said he he had to approach facing one of his rivals with the intent to win and sure enough it worked out for Novak and that he he still got through the semifinals and, and won last year as well but it was a somewhat of a similar scenario where you've seen these two players uh, you know give everything they have in a match that technically meant nothing hmm. I mean, it was it was mental that it even came to that because the only reason it came to that was because Sitsipas pulled out when he shouldn't yeah. even have gone on the court anyway. Yeah, he definitely went on the court just to claim his prize money um, <laughs> because he everybody who I spoke to who was there said that there was no chance he was ever going to complete that match. Yeah, and and if you pull out what was it three games like it's it's yeah. you know that's that that's not a like oh I thought I might be able to get through it like it's just that, you have that, to that's when you. I was going to say, you, you have to think uh, her catch must be a little ticked off, too, because yeah. I feel like with, with his serve and actually the tennis he's been playing through through the fall, he could have potentially done some damage had he been there from the get-go, conceivably training and ready and getting three matches. I mean, we saw him push Novak, and the way he's spot-serving and, and plays on that surface, like, he could have been honestly a threat. Hmm. I mean, I, th- I think Hubert Hercatch will think still take home about four hundred thousand dollars, which will probably soften the blow for <laughs> half a week's work. But yeah, um, yeah, I, I, I think the other thing. Well, there's two other things I think played a part in the Sinner performance against Runa, which he had never beaten Runa uh, in their pro career anyway. I imagine they probably played coming up at some level. I mean, he won't beat him in juniors because Runa was the world number one, and Sinner was not very good as a junior. No, so no. They, I doubt they might not even have played in juniors because yeah. their, their levels were so different. Um, and also, obviously, playing in Italy, like home crowd, like real hard to, to sort yeah. of. Yeah, there, there is that side of it. And, you know, the crowd did get. Um, although Dan- Daniela Hantachova called it one of the greatest tennis matches that the sport has ever seen, which I thought might have oversold it a little bit um, on, on Amazon Prime. But um, <laughs> being that it was basically a dead rubber um, in, in, the, in the World Tour finals. But, um, um, but yeah, I mean. I, I thought as well something that concerns me a little bit about Sinner, just going going more onto his game, is that he doesn't make first serves when he really needs them. And this has become a thing. And even in the matches that he won, even the match when he beat Djokovic, there was one service game, there was one long service game where I think he missed eight first serves in a row. Um, and that's basically something that I think torments him in his career in those those bigger matches. Um, is that is that a mental issue, do you think? I think it's a little bit of that. I think he goes for too much on it as well. I think he, he he's also got like, because he's quite gangly, there, there's a lot going on in his service action as well. That I wouldn't say it's a bad service action or anything like that, but because he's, he's quite, like I say, he's quite gangly, that, that there's just a lot of things that under pressure can can go wrong in it. And I think there's a few things, that little things that can go wrong. Whereas if you look at like Alcaraz's action, it's a really simple action. There's not much can, that can go wrong there. And I think if you look at, I don't think there's very much in their serves at all, Alcaraz and um, Sinner, for example. I think they've probably got similar levels of serve, which are both quite good serves at, at that level. Uh, good serves, I'd say, at that level in terms of pace and what have you. I'd even say Sinner might have a little bit of a better serve, but you wouldn't get, Alcaraz missing as many first serves on big points as Sinner misses. Um, I think generally, not not just in this tournament. I think that's it's one to keep an eye on. I think that on the big points when he really needs to hold serve, um, or when he gets broken, usually in matches. I think if you look back, I think it's because he's made less than fifty percent first serves. Mm. 
I suppose it is the thing that we keep saying about Yannick Sinner is that he's been in a lot of really big matches and he's not always ended up like he's always in a classic. Like almost every Grand Slam he plays, he's in at least one classic. He doesn't end up on the right side of them enough. There does to me seem to have been a, a real uptick in his his ability in the last six, eight months, I think, or at least in his results. I think Darren Cahill's a big part of that. Like I, I, he's probably the best coach in the world, certainly one of them. And I think he's had a big impact. Um, just before we let you go, Ben, because I know you've got a day job to do as well, um, on Yannick Sinner, it feels like a big 2024 for him. Like, like there could be a really big result in the in the sort of in the stars for him. I agree. Uh, I, I don't know that I necessarily want to say he's going to win a Grand Slam. I, I feel like this past season, even though I believe what he made the semi semifinals, that Wimbledon. I expected more actually uh, like he, he, he wasn't, he didn't really give a, a strong push in that semifinal that I, I expect a grand slam final for 2024. I think he should be winning multiple masters 1000s. I mean, if we go back to just watching him in Toronto, he completely dominated the national bank open here. I, I mean, that was like a comfortable win. I, I know a lot of the draw kind of blew up around him in, in a sense. And Carlos Alcaraz had a bit of an early exit. You had Tommy Paul in the semis. I mean, keep in mind, he's a very good player, but Alex Dimenauer making his first Masters 1000, it, it felt like a, you know, a kind of a formality that Yannick Sinner was going to get his first Masters 1000 title there. But obviously he's an all-surface player. Like he does feel like somebody who should be winning, you know, two to three Masters 1000s per season. And it, it's a bit surprising, if anything, that he hasn't been to a Grand Slam final. I, I think the Australian Open, though Novak is unquestionably going to be the favorite, could be a little more interesting coming into 2024 um, with Yannick Sinner having taken that step forward and the fact that we didn't have Carlos Alcaraz play it last year. Yeah, certainly creates a just, mix. Just last word on the tournament, James. I, I saw this morning that Paul McNamee was banging on about how it was a disgrace that the ATP selected a fast court for this and this is why we shouldn't have fast courts. And I thought it bizarre that when you look at the absolute dirge that they play on throughout the year on hard courts, it's slow rubbish where you can't have any kind of variation in match. And then as soon as you put a fast court down, which, let's be honest, provided a very good tournament overall. There were some mm. really good matches. And then you're complaining about it, that it's too fast. We don't need to do this. And that's somebody who has like quite an influence in the game. I thought it was pretty poor form to be saying that. Yeah, I think I try not to give Paul McNamee too much of the time of day on Twitter because he does talk a lot. I, I, like, it's that kind of inevitable thing. If you tweet a lot, some of the things you're going to say are not going to make a lot of sense. That's my opinion. And Al Alcaraz complained about that right after his first match, right? He was complaining... Uh, and, and maybe this is why Paul is tweeting about it, is that Alcaraz getting there, he said, like, oh, we haven't played on anything nearly this fast all season and sort of, you know, people took it as whining about adapting to conditions. But I mean, I guess this, this has sort of been the reality always of indoor at the ATP World Tour Finals. I mean, he's quite a bit rich, that coming from Alcaraz, being that he won Wimbledon on maybe the slowest you can ever possibly get a grass court. <laughs> um, so, you know, one for one on that one. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. Um, anyway, Ben, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute pleasure. Um, I, George is in real danger, I think, to be honest. Um, <laughs> more than adequately filled in for him. Uh, best of luck, obviously, this week with the, the Davis Cup Finals. I know you'll be following very closely. And uh, where can people find you on social media? Yeah, you can find me uh, at Ben Lewis MPC, the MPC standing for Matchpoint Canada. And you can find us, uh, the podcast as well, at Matchpoint Canada. We're on all the socials if you want to check it out. Uh, yeah, James Calvin, it's it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much. Take Thanks, care. Ben. After this, uh, we'll be throwing some of your questions at Calvin. Welcome back to the Tennis Unfiltered podcast with me, James Gray of inews.co.uk and the iNewspaper, where our mailbag is overflowing uh, those of you who know our email address, it's tennisunfiltered at gmail.com, have certainly put it to good use uh, this week. And uh, I will do my best to get through as many of them and put Calvin to the test as much as I can. Before that, I should say uh, we've had a couple of lovely five-star reviews. Um, one from Australia, uh, from Nukester1971, says, So British, so good. 
which sounds a bit like a Tory party election slogan, which I'm not wild about. But anyway, um, from Oz, and though I often find opinions sometimes just an unfair or tough take on topics, e.g. Dimitrov, uh, I always really enjoy every pod, a recent listener for the last few months. And though I listen to the other English pod as well, I find myself listening to yours first when it lands here in Oz. Calvin's Guinness story was a classic, and his description of Kyrgios Village Idiot, hilarious. Keep it up, guys. Um, and we've also had one from the States, from Agnes and Stanley. I... I those names are of a different era, and I like to think that they'd sit round by the fire on a Wednesday evening and listen to us. Uh, deep dig. If you want to hear about the challenges of the tour, this is a good listen. Unvarnished, refreshing, and digging deep into the realm of the tennis sporting world. Highly recommend if you're invested in the sport of tennis. Thanks, guys. Um, the reviews are really just ego polishing, to be honest. They don't help with discoverability, despite what everyone thinks. They're just lovely. So um, send us a five-star one, and we will always read it out. So, on to emails, Calvin. Um, I'm going to start, I think, with... Well, since we've just been talking about Djokovic and Alcaraz, maybe it's the best place to start. Keith has emailed in saying, I really enjoy your podcast. I'll preface this question with the fact that I'm a huge Djokovic fan and have been since 2008. I'd like your opinion if you think it's a good idea that Alcaraz continues to practice with Djokovic pre-tournament. I watched their practice sets in Paris and Turin on YouTube. Djokovic beat him easily in both. Do those practice sets mean anything? Is Djokovic building up a psychological advantage? Uh, thanks for your time. Thanks for your question, uh, Keith. What do you think, Calvin? Uh, no, they don't mean anything at all. I mean, to give some idea, uh, Andy Murray beat Djokovic 6-2 in a practice set at this year's Wimbledon. Um, <laughs> and, you know, we know how that turned out for both players. Um, mm. I always find it strange. This is not, not at all referring to Keith. I found it strange, actually. I guess it's because like, I don't tend to Instagram much, but I've I guess over the last few weeks I've gone on it a little bit more so my algorithms have kind of updated them and I get to see a lot more of what the geniuses at Instagram think I want to see so there's been like quite a bit more tennis on there and I do find it and, and the same on Twitter as well I find it bizarre how interested people are and this is from the main accounts like tennis TV are big on this how interested people are about who's practicing with each other and they make a huge deal of it like oh uh, Djokovic is practicing with Alcaraz today, and like, well, they will. They do that. They tend to do that all the time. The the players, the best players, tend to play with any. Well, they play with most of the best players, and it just depends. The rotation just just depends. You know, it's it's one of those things. At this week's tournament, there was only eight players there. You're not going to practice with anyone in your own group, so mm. you're probably going to want six. You're probably going to want three practice sets. You could, you're probably going to practice with all three of the players who are in the opposite group, or all four of them. Um, mm. So, it it just the players players just practice with each other it's not not new the ma male players the women players never practice with each other um <laughs> but the the male the male players just practice with each other all the time and they tend to know because they're around longer in the tournaments djokovic would want to practice would tend to know alcaraz more and that kind of thing you, you know they become more friendly a lot of them have played with each other since juniors but mm. there's there's nothing really ever to be read into practice sets and to who wins them yeah, I guess the only thing I would maybe caveat that is there are times when like, you know, someone plays a, a new player or an unknown player, they go, oh, well, I've never even practiced with them. You know, like I don't even know what they're, but, and I have heard players say, so it was a bit of an adjustment, you know, the first few games, just getting used to the way they hit the ball. But as you say, Djokovic and Alcaraz now have played enough times. And also like, if you're deep in a tournament, Calvin, like, there aren't that many people left, right? Like, yeah, exactly. You, you yeah, limited yeah. choice of hitting partners. Uh, I remember yeah. hearing people talk about like quite often ending up, you know, at maybe the lower level, like hitting with the person they're playing in the final to warm up. That <laughs> happens. That's happened regularly. I mean, Djokovic has a hitting partner as well that he takes round with him. So right. he he practices with it, you know. He, but some players don't want to do that, you know. Mm. Some I think there's. There's nothing like, listen, Djokovic is not going to notice anything in practice with Alcaraz that he doesn't already know and vice versa. Yeah. And if they do, then it's it probably holds no weight because it's just practice as well. So, hmm. um, yeah, it's just one of those things. you want. To, some players like to play practice sets. I, I like my, the lads who I coach, I like them to play a lot of practice sets. Some players don't play any practice sets at all. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's strange, isn't it? I remember going and watching, um, do you remember the French Open? We watched Evo play that practice set against, yeah, against Corder. Corder. And I, I get the impression that Evo is the kind of person who's like, if it's not a practice set, pr pr you know, he he needs that, right? He needs the sort of competitive Yeah, well, edge. his practice is a lot of points as well, you know, and 
points with something on them, whether yeah. it be a bit of money or or lunch or something like that. That's the way that he is as a person. You know, mm. it's, um... yeah. His uh, his volley games against Piper are incredibly competitive. Like, yeah. I don't really understand how the game works, but like it involves there's, li- there's variations of it, and it's <laughs> it's always up for debate as to how it works. This <laughs> is the most the volley game has the most rotating and vague rules. But, there's something I about mean, if you leave it, like there's something about leaving it and winning a point, right? No, you can't hit a, you can't hit a clean winner at it. That's the right. thing. So if it's a clean winner, the point is void. But then it comes into debate whether players think that they can't get the ball back, so they'll leave it and right. claim it was a clean winner <laughs> rather than trying to get a racket on it and not winning the point. So it's the whole thing is you've got to hit it at the opponent. You can't hit it past them. I see. Um, okay. So, but that's only one. Then sometimes you've played it where there, you can hit winners and that kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. It's good to what I should say. If if like, I always recommend fans go and watch practice because I think it's really interesting and you can get much closer to the players than you would like when they're playing. If if you see Evo on a practice schedule, it like it's always fun. Like I just sometimes will wander and go and have my lunch next to the court where he's practicing because he he does enjoy it and I think it's just it's just nice to see someone having fun on the tennis court for once. Um, right, thanks for your email, Keith. Hope that's answered your question in part. Let's move on. Um, I'm going to go for Stefanos Sitsipas. Matthew has written in to say, I think a regular correspondent says, it seems obvious to me that Steph Sitsipas has regressed in the last few years. And my question is why? I find it hard to believe that the current version we're witnessing is the same one that came from two sets down to beat Rafa Nadal, that beat team in the World Tour finals and took Djokovic to five sets twice at Roland Garros. I appreciate that confidence is a fragile thing, but it also seems like technically he's a worse player. His backhand has always been a weakness, but I'm sure he was way more competitive before. What's your explanation? I, I'm not saying that I don't think he's got worse, but I'm, I don't know if it's that he's got worse or that the other players have just figured him out a bit. I mean, there are there was a time where I would watch and it would baffle me how how much respect players would give his backhand or not fully understand how shit his backhand was. Um, and I think now a lot of the players just just punish it and they realize that he can't really do any damage on it he kind of this is the thing though like he'll 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 his backhand will be absolute dross for like five games and then he'll hit a backhand winner and then one of the commentators will go and some people doubt his backhand <laughs> it's like well <laughs> yeah because he's just been crap for the last 25 minutes and he's hit one good shot yeah like that doesn't mean his backhand's good um, but it is a bad shot. The match that the the real the match when he beat Nadal was bizarre because he that match he seemed to have just got a new backhand. He hit great, and then he, he's never been the same. Look, you know, he serves great. He's still got the best like stats for the plus one on the tour. I think Is that right in terms of like if he gets a forehand, he's still got the best conversion of any player. Mm. Yeah, it was interesting. Um... I was you talking about Tennis Insights a lot today. I'd definitely go give them a follow. For people who don't know who Tennis Insights are, it's essentially CrickFizz. If people are familiar with CrickFizz, it's their their tennis wing, or at least it's a sort of co-venture. Um, and yeah, they're great on Twitter. And I think, I mean, Calvin, I know you're a big fan, but I think what's different is they've they've managed to make stats simple. Like... Made them simple and relevant to the game and things that you actually explain what's happening in a tennis match, I, I think, as opposed to some of the tennis stats that we get. Um, I, I know the, the official ATP ones that come, because I watch a lot of challenges, because like Luke, who I coach, plays plays some challenges, and, and Henry still plays the odd one, and I just watch a lot. And the, at, the end of each, at the end of each changeover, they put bog standard stats on, and it's always like first serve points won. But they don't put first serve percentage on there. So it's like, well, it could be like first serve points won ninety percent, but they've only made three first serves. <laughs> exactly, like, it doesn't mean anything. But they, they actually, you know, they have good stats that actually explain why you can watch those stats. I can not watch a tennis match. Look at tennis insights as like, like I say, their their main five stats, and I can see, okay, that's what happened there. Then, mm. uh, a good stat. Just I was just having a look to see if there's anything on the six pass backhand, and good one from the. Um... The Sitsipas match against Sinner this week, uh, where um, in the first set Sinner won a hundred percent of points, where he served to the. Uh, I remember Sitsipas that, backhand. yeah, yeah, on yeah. first serve at least. 
I mean that, that wasn't is... it wasn't it when he went wasn't it when he went into his backhand on the shot after the serve? Or I was, think it, was it... I think it's specifically first serve directions, yeah. Okay, there was oh. a similar one where if he hit his first shot into the backhand, he won every single point as well, or it like ninety percent of points. Yeah, I think it's crazy. I mean, I know we've talked about this before, Calvin, but it probably worked, bears repeating. How, how on earth? Well, how do you how do you fix that? I I don't think that he will get better at it. If I'm honest, I think it, at the age he's at, I don't think you can. You might so be able to make about his back. It. Yeah, you might be able to make his backhand a little bit better, but I don't think making his backhand at that level of the game, I think you're looking at sort of incremental differences, and you know maybe getting it three or four percent better, and you'd have done a good job there. I don't know if getting his backhand three or four percent better actually makes a whole lot of difference. Mm. Um, and I, I, I thought it would have got better by now, but I think you have a window of opportunity to actually improve on things like that. And although he's still young in in human terms, and in, I guess in tennis terms as well, I think he's only twenty three, twenty four, isn't he? Um, how old is he? Is he twenty three? Maybe twenty five. Uh, no, he's twenty five. Twenty five. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, I think in that regard, he's he's kind of like missed his opportunity. I'd be surprised if we ever see Nick um, Stefan Sitsi pass having a having a great backhand or mm. even having a good backhand. Yeah, yeah, probably more a case of just trying to trying to hide it somewhere. I, I guess one of the things I, I, he could use is slice more. He could do what Evo does um, and just basically learn a slice because he is a talented lad. He's got a nice feel and that kind of thing, but. Again, I don't think he's going to... One of the reasons I don't think he's going to get any better is because he doesn't have a tennis coach. Mm. Well, yes, quite. Um, right, Hugh on email has got a question about tennis balls. I know we love balls on this podcast. Um, as someone who has played to a good standard in Ireland, uh, where we have been and often are the number one tennis podcast, so thanks for listening, Hugh, um, I found that simple things like tennis balls going dead and not wanting to buy a new set of balls every time I played meant I could never get used to faster speeds as the balls would always die by about game 10 or 11. This also hindered me in tournaments where we would play with fresh balls every match. I feel like it held back my level. Is this an issue for juniors? Um, I, I think it's quite an interesting question, Calvin, because, yeah, you know, you don't want to be buying a set of tennis balls every time you go and practice, do you? No, they're expensive, tennis mm. balls, um, even for coaches. And that is a problem. You know, a lot of centres, I'm quite privileged with the lads who I coach because we tend to get new tennis balls all the time and we're at tournaments and if we're training somewhere, they'll provide us or the lads' sponsors will provide them with tennis balls um, to practice with. So we're, we're quite privileged in that regard. But when I go and see, I have I do a bit of county training and that kind of thing and I go around various centres to do that. And the tennis balls are pretty dire and that's not me having a go at the people who do them because tennis balls are expensive. Yeah, I was actually pretty privileged as well when I first started coaching because um, I don't know if anyone knows this, but tennis ball, the te- the Slazinger factory where the balls for all over the world was made was in Barnsley. Oh, really? um, and they, I just went when I first started and asked if they had any like cast off balls. And they basically, if you imagine a tennis ball and like where it was stamped um, and Slazinger's quality control was so high that if any of the balls, if the stamp was lopsided, they'd all just go in the bin. Right. Um, so about every every four or five weeks, I'd go down there and give me a full black bag of tennis balls for free, <laughs> brand new ones. I the, like the, the idea. It's like out the back door, just like a little back door yeah. seal. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But um, and then that shut down in Barnsley. That was a real, real awakener <laughs> for me. That was having to buy tennis balls. Um, but yeah, they, they, there's not much you can do about it. Tennis balls are very expensive. Yeah. Um, Hugh also adds, uh, it also ama- why has tennis never sorted out a decent ball machine with very high speeds? It amazes me. Um, I I think ball machines are crap anyway, so I'd stay away from that. <laughs> there you and, go. In Hugh. Gen- I mean, I don't. I'll, I'll. You know, people might find it interesting. I I do not like ball machines because they don't teach you anything other than the hitting of a ball, and that is only about twenty percent of the actual stroke of tennis, and it. De- taken from without getting to boring coaching theory it takes the hitting out of context in which case that it doesn't actually help you hit the ball uh either and it, it stops you it prevents you doing other things that you won't recover i've had players who before i coached them spent a lot of time on uh, on a ball machine and trying to get them to understand the game of tennis when not when they've been brought up in a ball machine or played a lot on a ball machine is 
is very, very difficult. And I know players who have got worse from spending too much time on a ball machine as well. Mm. There you go, Hugh. Um, right, uh, let's go to Blair on email, who says, I've only recently come across your podcast. I'm enjoying both listening to your new episodes and trawling through your back catalogue, um, so to speak. Uh, I have a query that hopefully one of you can shed some light on. What is the difference in matches between two of the top players, say Alcaraz and Djokovic, matches between two players ranked in the hundreds, um, Max, Max Marterer and Hugo Gaston to pick on the two players ranked 100 and 101 respectively as today, uh, and matches between players ranked around 1,000. Um, so matches between players of a similar ranking, but um, at different levels of the game. Uh, are the points shorter or longer in matches between top players? Are they more likely to end on a winner than in matches between lower ranked players? Are there more unforced errors? Um, another way of putting it, Blair says, is if you couldn't tell who the players were but could see what was happening on the court, could you tell the rankings of the players? I, think, pro- I mean, I think that's a really interesting question, Calvin. What what do tennis matches look like? Uh, between 1 and 100, you definitely wouldn't be able to tell. Um, mm. The standard, actual standard of ball striking, uh, movement, that kind of thing, these are the, the very elite players, and it's only very, very minute stuff that separates them. So Djokovic and Alcaraz... If if the actual just if you'd taken the faces off them and you didn't know who was playing, you wouldn't really notice a whole lot of difference uh, in ball striking. And you could even go down the levels in saying that. If you watch players that ranked about 300, those guys can seriously play tennis. Mm. They're excellent tennis players. Well, think about it in terms of other sports, like the 300th best footballer in the world probably plays for Manchester City at the minute um, yeah. overall. And, you know, so you're talking about the very, very best. And even down at a thousand, the only thing I would say is that the the top and middle level of those guys is 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 high. Um, it's probably the bottom level that's not at a thousand, and yeah, maybe a thousand, but maybe sort of seven hundred, eight hundred. Mm. Um, there's still some very very good tennis being played there in terms of ball speeds, serve speeds. It's not like the ball's getting hit any harder lower down. It's it's again, it's very very minute things in terms of decision-making and that kind of thing. Mentality, character is what separates a lot of them, especially in that range of sort of 600 to 200. There's a lot of guys who are very, very good ball strikers, movers, that kind of thing, and they just don't have the mentality and character to do it week in, week out. But their, their, their base level and their standard good level is is just as high as some of the guys in the top 100. Hmm. Um, I suppose my instinct, just to kind of pick up on one of Blair's points, is that the lower down the levels you go, the more unforced errors there are. Is that, is that right? I mean, to a degree it is. But again, it's... I wouldn't say... It depends what level you're talking to. I don't think there'd be more enforced errors in play in say if two guys were playing in a challenger semi final, there wouldn't necessarily be more enforced errors um mm. than there are in, in say a masters semi final. Um it would be more lower down, you would start to get there, yeah, you'd get a few more errors, but not not loads more, but you know, it depends what you're you know. If you're dealing with two guys who are, say, a 1,000, but they're on the way up, that's going to be different from two guys who have been around at a 1,000 for some time. Yeah. Um, sure. So, yeah, it's it's more the range of... I'd say the main difference is the range of different standards of players at the levels. If, you, if, you're, if you're ranked 900 in the world, the range of... If you tell me that somebody's ranked 900 now, the range of how good they can be is is quite substantial. Whereas if you told me that somebody's ranked 100 in the world, I already know they're very good. Right. Uh, right. Uh, Matt Gunner on Twitter. We are at Unfilter Tennis on Twitter, or X. Unfilter Tennis, that is. I know it's a bit weird. Uh, it's because our name is too long for Twitter. Um, he says, for a long time, I believe faster courts led to more serve and volley. But this isn't the case. Is this because string technology and racket head sizes give the advantage to a returner? Or is it just because there aren't elite serve and volley players anymore? A question we get a lot, Calvin, but people always seem to be interested in your thoughts on it. I think historically that was the case that it was you'd get more serve and volleys. The difference is there aren't many fast surfaces now, so there aren't many people who actually practice serve volleying. So when they get on a fast surface, they're gonna they're not gonna do something that they don't do on a regular basis. 
Mm. So that's that's the only reason I would say that that, that pe- players because you wouldn't develop a serve volleying game um, as a as a base level because you're not going to be able to do it at most of the tournaments. And so when you're going to do it, the only reason you're going to do it is a mix up. But you're not going to come out not like you're going to play, you know, eighty five percent of the year doing something, and then because you change surface, you're going to go and do something completely different. You're just gonna you're gonna do it a little bit more, but not not loads more. But I think that's it. If 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 there were as many fast surfaces on the tour as there currently are slow surfaces on the tour, I'm absolutely certain that you'd get a lot more players who would be serve volleying as their base tactic. Mm. I, I mean, why just to talk about the the one proper serve volleyer on tour at the moment? Why is Maxime Cressy the way he is? Is he just he's got a massive serve and, and maybe didn't have much else, and so he went ran with it? He's got massive serve and he volleys pretty well. Um, and he also has a kind of a, I don't know if carefree attitude is the right word, but he's willing to, the way he plays, he's willing to go, this is how I'm going to play. If you can beat me, fair enough. If you can't, then, you know, this is why, this is how I play. <coughs> so it's not like he's constantly desperate to win any tennis match he plays. He's kind of like, this is my style. I'm going with it. Hmm. Uh, right, one more, I think, from David on email. There's lots of different questions in here, so I'll read the whole email and then we can kind of pick the bones out of it. Uh, normally around the time of Grand Slams, the women playing best of five chestnut comes up. We are regularly told they are happy to play best of five or have offered to. Not exactly campaigning for this, but that's another story. Anyway, on the assumption that WTA is serious about this, I think assuming WTA is serious about anything is a bit dangerous, but anyway, um, why not make three out of four of their 1,000 events, a best-of-five final, including the Tour Finals, which was the case for a while, about 35 years ago. Extra ranking points could be offered for these events, and a separate main sponsor could be brought in to promote tournaments, surely good for publicity and finances. In fact, if you made it five events, it could be heralded as the women go five in five. Uh, If this proves a success, you could make a reasonable case to make the Grand Slams best-of-five from the quarters at least. Uh, I would add I'm totally against the best of three for men and women in the first week, increasing to five in the second suggestion. Utterly stupid. Um, Calvin, there's a couple of other questions, but actually I'm, we'll come back to them. Um, women playing best of five. I know you think don't extend the product if you think the product is bad, right? Yeah, I, I don't want to see it. Um, to be honest, I think that it's got to get... There's too many women's tennis matches that are pretty one-sided. Mm-hmm. Um, at, even at the highest level, and I don't really see the value in adding just another set onto that for no particular reason. Um, I think there's much bigger problems to solve in the women's game, in particular, than adding extra, than making it longer. Yeah, I, I suppose the so the argument that I think is often made is, well, you know, it does happen in the men's game where people go two sets down and then win the next three. I mean, Noah Djokovic is the expert at it. And so you could argue that how many of those one-sided women's matches that only go, you know, that last an hour and 10 minutes would end up actually going a lot longer and being a more interesting contest because of it. I think probably the the sort of instant repost to that is you look at World Tour Finals. Like, how many bagel sets were there at WTA World Tour Finals this year? Bloody loads. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's what I mean. You can say that the you know the, the players come back, but yeah, look at the comebacks. How many come? How many players come back from six two six love, <laughs> and then win in five? It yeah. just never happens. Yeah. If the women were playing, you know, if the if the women had a lot of matches that were going like seven five seven six, or every match was like that, then I could see more of an argument. But I I don't like I say I, I don't really see what it does other than saying it's the same as the men's for the sake of saying it's the same as the men's I don't mm. think it helps there's again there's so much that tennis as a whole not just women's tennis but tennis as a whole needs to get better at and that to me would just be I don't think it'll happen to be honest um because I don't see why it would um yeah but I also don't see any sense in saying the men play best of three in the first week because again this is the same argument as I come out with the doubles. There's not going to be enough tennis hmm. at the tournaments. What are you going to do for the second? What are you going to do when you get past Wednesday? Yeah, at some of these to tournaments. The third round. Yeah, because it tennis does will actually be done get by a bit about sparse. half past two. Yeah, yeah ten- it does. Well, it does. Get it's pretty sparse. Hundred percent sparse. So when when you get people going, oh, you know, bin doubles off. Like no one cares about doubles. 
okay, let's see what people are watching on a Thursday and a Friday afternoon at the, mm. at the slams. Yeah, you wouldn't end up with enough. Um, just a couple of other things on David's email, which we might as well pick up. Uh, he says, as a footnote to this, did the WTA miss a trick by not employing Chris Commode? I assume they haven't tried to, but failed. I know George has lots of thoughts on Chris Commode. I don't know if you have any, Calvin. But um... I don't have any. don't really know. <laughs> Very, fair enough. Um, and the other one, which I can shed a bit of light on, is one final thing. ATP WTA TV coverage in the UK from 2024 onwards. I've not seen anything about contracts for this. Can you shed any light on this, please? Well, as people will know, the ATP World Tour Finals was the end of Amazon's five-year um, tour coverage, uh, which has... I think most people, we'll come on to 2024 in a moment, but I think, Calvin, most people have been broadly positive of Amazon overall, like in the round. It's still too hard to find, I think. Yeah, my only complaint with it is how how quickly you can get onto a match, and I keep saying this. I think the last time, I, I think it was nine menus you have to go through from yeah. putting it on. Not menus, but, you know, and the ones that they could have just cut out, like the rubbish they could cut out, like you select the match and then it asks you watch live or yeah. from the beginning. Like, just watch it. If you want to watch it from the beginning, just have a different button or you just rewind it. Yeah, like, yeah. you don't have to go in. You know, it's just quite, quite frustrating, that kind of thing. But once you're actually on it, or, or just you just have it on the menu. You know, it's like Amazon's so weird with the main menu. Like, yeah, the like I say, I, I tell the story again that I... They do these algorithms. I remember once I bought a toilet seat once in my entire life, and every single time I go on Amazon now, it suggests for me to buy a toilet seat, <laughs> whereas I spend my entire life watching tennis, and I still have to go through nine menus to find the tennis. Yeah. Um, so that would be one thing. What the positives on it, I think the coverage has generally been very good. The the ability to watch all the matches, I I really hope Sky are going to do that because if not, it's a massive step back if they don't utilize like Red Button and like you can any tournament that's on Amazon, you can watch any match that's on it. Yeah. Um, and yeah, as Calvin alludes to there, um, we expect an announcement in the coming weeks from Sky that they will pick up. Uh, both tours uh, we don't know what that coverage is going to look like yet they obviously had the us open back on sky for the first time in um six years uh this time around people there was some criticism we obviously did if you go back through our um our back catalog as someone has been doing you'll find an episode just after the us open which is all about where i spoke to some people at sky and we talked through the issues and they gave us a, a bit of a response so if you really want to drill, drill down into that then you can um, but yes, I, I spoke to a couple of people actually just before the US Open um, and I said, well, you know, you're going to get the tour, aren't you? And yeah, the noises were broadly broadly positive. They just, I think, hadn't quite um, crossed the I's and dotted the T's, as they say. I think, again, what will be interesting with Sky as well is like, because Amazon often have two tournaments on in the same week mm. and that's something that Sky have never done. Like if there's two 500s on in the same week or two 250s and especially in the, if the women's are on that week as well, they can have two women's, two men's. You can have four tournaments going on. Yeah. Because you can do that with menus that you can't really do with channels. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Um and I'd be interested to see how they get around that. But it does worry me a little bit because Sky have been terrible with their other sports for cutting costs yeah. and not offering the product that they used to offer, where it's basically now just Formula One cricket and I mean football hasn't reduced, but cricket in particular have they've basically massively cut the budget and it's just repeats that they show. Um yeah, they've Whereas, really, really scaled back on that. Yeah, yeah and I, I really hope that they don't. I don't know what the cost... You'd imagine it doesn't cost that much just put matches on red button. Just take the world feed, yeah. I mean, yeah, I don't I'm, I don't know the ins and outs of scheduling that kind of stuff. Yeah. I mean, they've got re they're really big on their digital platforms and they're really big on the app. And during the US Open, they were very keen to push the idea that you could watch every match on the app. Yeah, yeah. Now, now you couldn't watch every every match on other platforms, which really annoyed me. Like I have Virgin, so I don't have a normal version of the Sky Sports app. So and and so I I could watch it on my phone, but I couldn't watch all the matches on my TV, even though I pay an, an eye watering amount of money to uh, have Sky Sports on my TV. So that that was annoying. But you know, I, I think they're broadly open to um to feedback, and and they understand that you know they're coming back into it for the first time in a while. So look, you won't always get what you want, but if you try, sometimes you get what you need. Um, and I think that's probably all we have for today, Calvin. You, you, 
I, I, look, I don't know if you're ever going to reveal your um, secret champions tiebreak uh, strategy. I don't even know if it counts as strategy yet. Uh, uh, I'll see if it, I'll, I'll see if it actually works next <laughs> year. Then I'll I'll tell people if it has success. Then I'll tell people then. But Great. Um, but if it fails, we'll just keep it secret. Li- little quiz for the viewers because I was just looking when when Ben was talking there. Now, obviously, I got all my CDs behind me, and I wonder if anybody. What's the most amount of my CDs that any of our YouTube viewers could identify based just on their spines? Oh, that's right a good there. one. There you go. Get a little snap. All right. I wonder if anybody can get ten. There you go. In the comments, I know on I can, I can actually look at them now, and even not the ones that are obvious, like the big ones that are like there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. they're obviously quite obvious. Um, but the other ones I can name about because I know where they are, but I can also recognise the sleeves. I can name about sixty percent of them. Yeah, I can't do anything interesting with my background. Can you recognise the person here? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's the only thing I can do. Um, anyway, uh, I hope you've enjoyed listening or watching, and you've enjoyed Ben. Um, we will have Pippa Horn with us next week in place of George, who will be back in two weeks' time. Uh, please do leave us a rating, a review. Get in touch on email, as many of you have. We love love getting the emails in. Always makes us talk about different things. Um, but most importantly, please do come back next week.